Ricardo's got a stronger background because of his Monero Enterprise Alliance background. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, Charlie has been a director of engineering at Coinbase and he created Litecoin. So you guys are pretty equally matched. Just send your resumes over and we'll have you guys fight it out. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, it's another early morning for me and late evening for some of the guys here. And we still have a Charlie Lee, Samson Mao, Ricardo, and myself. Um, so let, let's start off with, um, it's been in, in the news yesterday. Uh, I know we're recording this now and uh, showing this a lot later. But um, there was a lot of controversy about the North American Bitcoin conference. And Ricardo was obviously there. Whenever there is any controversy, is there? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, how did you experience it? How, uh, it's not your first time at the conference, but I've heard quite a lot of uh, complaints about it. Uh, so this year was just massive. It was like insanely bigger than last year. Like last year, we were almost shoved into a corner of the facility, and this year it was like sprawling over two levels and there was just an insane amount of space i mean last year the vendor booth area i mean there were maybe six booths and this year there was just every ico and their grandma had a booth um which i guess was one of the main complaints was the number of icos there but at the same time what, what do you do you know it's not a technical conference so you can't say to people that want to have booths and that have the money like no go away up the money, excuse the pun, then I, I don't see a problem with accepting it and letting them letting them show their ways. Um, at the end of the day, that's the only way to really expose the stuff anyway, is to have them like go up on stage and have robots douse them in smoke and let people look at it and go, what? Um, because if we do it any other way, then what's the point? So what was your favorite ICO? Oh man, there were so many. I guess the, the augmented reality, virtual reality ones. I have no idea what what they need a blockchain for. No one could explain to me what they need a blockchain for. They kept they kept. But trying. they do use a blockchain, right? They they almost pack all the buzzwords in. It's like so. What we've de what we've developed is uh, VR AR goggles that um, offer VR as a service on the blockchain in a container or whatever. You know, like let's pack all the buzzwords in. The only thing they were missing is AI. Well, there was also um, some controversy about the after party or something like that in a strip club. But I don't know if it was an official after party or there was just some a couple of people who went there. Or okay, so that was the Dash official after party on the Saturday okay. night. It was called on the agenda. It said the Dash networking event sponsored by Dash. So there's no just so there's no confusion. This was like you know on the on the um, the Friday night was the official. Uh, sorry, the Thursday night was the official welcome party at the Cleveland. On the Friday night was the Dash networking event. So this wasn't, you know, like like I've heard a couple of people say, don't blame Dash, yada, yada, yada. At the end of the day, whether somebody organized it and Dash was complicit or whether Dash organized it is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is it was at a, at a, a strip club. And, um, you know, like... I don't care if people go to strip clubs, like, go ahead, if you know, whatever floats your boat. But I think there's some stuff that feels like appropriate, subjectively uh, feels appropriate for a conference like this. And there's some stuff that doesn't. Um, and, and subjectively to me, that, that like grated me a bit because, um, I mean, I was at a yacht party at the time and like, like, so, so I didn't go. So I wasn't, I wasn't there personally to experience it but i guess it just feels like this you know are, are we trying to create a culture and an environment where people go like oh okay i went to a bitcoin conference and there were a thousand lambos parked outside and i went to a strip club as the official party is that the culture we're trying to create because that just feels like um it, f it feels like a bitconnect conference yeah it feels very cheap <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I also saw on the website there were like uh, at least forty or fifty uh, 
speakers listed under ICOs because they had a separate uh, section for ICOs, and it was like a crazy amount amount of uh, ICO speakers. But from what I understand, you you also only had like fifty minutes to quickly do your talk because your talk was great. I saw your talk. Uh, you only had a very limited amount of time, it seemed. Yeah. Uh, so I only had 15 minutes, but then the ICO pitches had even less. So um, they, a lot of this stuff was really just genuinely elevator pitches. Um, I, I do think, again, this isn't a technical conference, you know. So um, it's, it's not like breaking Bitcoin or skating Bitcoin or anything like that where... Um, you, you'd want to, uh, you want a year from devs and whatever. At the same time, I think that people there need to be exposed to some of the interesting technical stuff. Um, otherwise, all they're getting are ICO pitches all day long. So I try to at least give them a little bit of, of interesting info in my talk. They're probably wondering when you're doing your next ICO. Oh, geez. <laughs> Can we get in on that? <laughs> okay so um the next topic is actually also a very interesting one um so greg maxwell resigned as cto of blockstream to to uh, further develop um the bitcoin privacy uh enhancements like uh, bulletproofs and uh, stuff like that uh can you, can you actually explain what bulletproofs are someone it's when okay. you can't get killed by a bullet <laughs> <laughs> okay there, they have. There's bulletproof vests and stuff that you can wear. <laughs> so when you have an armored car. Yeah, that's bulletproof also. Yeah. Well, speaking of Greg Maxwell, I'm surprised it took him that long to to quit vlog stream. Why? It's awesome. Right? <laughs> not a not a dish on vlog stream. It's just that I can't imagine like how annoying it is to have to be CTO of vlog stream and deal with all this. Stupid, stupid blockchain related stuff, and still try to like code for, for Bitcoin. It's just like crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of drama. Yeah, <laughs> as you may have heard. A lot of drama, a lot of hate. Recently, there was a, a music video. I wonder if he didn't have a fallout with um, what's it, the Bilderbergs? You know, like <laughs> like in in one of their secret Illuminati meetings. Maybe he just had a fallout with them. Yeah, it happens all the time. No, I heard that the XSC CEO um, requested that he was removed from his position. So, <laughs> no, but on a serious note, I, 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 he mentioned that uh, there's too many other responsibilities um, that came in the way of his actually developing something, and that he had to focus on other uh, side chains and uh, other stuff that the uh, block team was working on. So, I, I think for Bitcoin itself, it's it's like uh, great news. I think it's great news. I think him focusing on. Um... Confidential transactions, bulletproof, um, snore signatures. I think it's great. Thanks, Samsung, for kicking them out. No worries. Well, the price was down, so we had to do something, right? So none of you guys can explain what bulletproof is. Okay. I, I, I'll yeah. do it. I'll do it. Okay. So in Monero and, and in confidential transactions, um, which is then used on Monero, um, instead of displaying the amount or instead of using the amount in a transaction, you use a commitment. And in order to make sure that you're not creating money out of thin air, there's a little bit of commitment arithmetic where you subtract the total um, uh, number or the total output commitments minus the total input commitments. The problem is that you could use a negative number to artificially create um, money out of thin air. And so what, what we use is something called range proofs and range proofs just prove that all the numbers, all the commitments are positive numbers without revealing the numbers. So it's a zero knowledge proof. And uh, bulletproofs is a compact way of doing range proofs. So it's it represents significant cost savings, um, which is of course highly advantageous because range proofs are massive uh, in and of themselves. So so that's all it really is, is just this fantastic cost saving. Um, and uh, the trick that bulletproofs uses uh, as a, a cost-saving mechanism or as a way to, to get to a cost-saving mechanism can be used to do other cool privacy-related stuff too. Okay, great. Uh, it seems that we lost uh, Charlie on the way, but... Yeah, I'm still here. Hey, sorry for the bad connection. I'm back. Hello, magical crypto friends. This is the real Charlie Lee. What were we talking about again? Oh, yeah. We were talking about my true vision. Litecoin Cash, 
It's the way Litecoin was always meant to be. Remember, it's not L cash. It's called Litecoin Cash. If I hear anyone say L cash again, I'm going to go full rot of beer on you. Anyways, Litecoin Cash, my true vision. Again, I'm the real Charlie. Lee. Okay, it's enough of that. Get the hell out of here. Okay, welcome back. Well, who is that guy? I don't know. He was really cool. Yeah, he was. He he was super interesting. Totally on point. We should have one more often. I think so. Totally. Some uh, reckless people have started testing lightning on the mainnet. There are now around uh, 100 different uh, participants, 230 channels. And Blockstream launched a commercial website uh, about the last week uh, where you can buy stickers. And we're really, really getting close to like really live. How should I put it? That, that big, really. Um, real life usage? Real life usage, yes. That's the word I was looking for and that I lost. I think that's a lie. I think it's just Samson sending payments to himself. <laughs> And setting up all the different nodes. Yeah, all the nodes are me, actually. Show me the proof it's more than one person. I'll show you the proof of sticker. Proof yeah, you're just giving stickers to yourself. Yeah. You have to buy it. You have to buy it, Charlie. You have to be reckless to buy one. Are you selling hats? I got lightning working, but all I got was this sticker. And well, we, we will do hats. It's on the, uh, it's on the roadmap. <laughs> it's on the roadmap. <laughs> and, and now... Um, Sadoshi Dice also starting again on the testnet. Um, so have you guys tried it yet? Wait, Satoshi Dice is doing what on what? Oh, they're already um, starting now with Lightning on the testnet. Oh. Or well, not not really the official uh, Satoshi Dice, but like a similar game. The official Satoshi Dice is is working on Bitcoin Cash, right? Or Bcash? Yeah, it's working on Bcash. Bcash. Not that it's like. Uh, get some any more uh, transactions but yeah it's there if anyone ever wanted to use it which yeah we know the answer to um oh we'll so, pen that i like your i like your t-shirt i just noticed it yeah <laughs> oops sell it sell it over a lightning e-commerce store no that would be reckless <laughs> reckless sticker is coming don't worry just as reckless oh, yeah. as the multi-sig wallet right <laughs> yeah just as reckless as the parody multi-sig wallet, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys haven't tested it yet. But what do you guys think if it, um, by the fact that it's already like li live now on the mainnet? Is it like too too reckless or? Well, in a, in a way, sometimes um, if it's on the on the mainnet, um, people will be more careful with it and test it better. Or I I think it's fine. I think like um. I mean, if you're just putting like twenty dollars on it, and if you happen to lose it, so be it, right? You're just testing it. I mean, if there's if no one's taking risk, then you won't get anywhere. So I, my thinking is that we have to start from somewhere, right? So people have to buy something or use Lightning on Mainnet for something. So it may as well be for low value items like stickers and T-shirts, and I think that will jumpstart it. And then that's actually what we're seeing now. There's there are more nodes, more channels open, and more people willing to test. Because if we don't test it somewhere, then we'll never get anywhere. There's not going to be one day where it's going to be totally safe. But if the risk profile is just stickers and, and T-shirts and stuff, I, I think we can handle that. I, I've also read, um, so somebody the other day was saying, like, uh, the, the big danger is if you use it for large payments. And I'm like, but if you're making a $100,000 payment, wouldn't you just make that as a normal Bitcoin payment? Why would you use Lightning? Yeah. Yeah, plus Lightning will not support large payments that easily because people won't have hundred thousand dollar payment channels open. Exactly. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, so I, I think that the not that the not that the risk is, is minimal at all, but I mean if you mostly using it for small payments, then the risk to both yourself and the counterparty is relatively low because you're only buying a ten dollar item or a twenty dollar item. And you know, worst case scenario, something happens and Whatever you you split the loss or someone takes a twenty dollar hit. That's why we have the a test net to test all this stuff, uh, all this stuff on. But in a way, people re it's a bit hype now. People really want to start using it. So I think that the 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 fact that it's now on the, on the main net, it's something positive. Um, as long as there's not too much fut, uh or too, too too much drama and too many losses and yeah the the other thing of course is uh, i've i've had this discussion um recently quite a lot uh testnet is 
um, is is great for well, you know, testing things. But it's more like a like a dev environment. You know, you you the people using testnet to test things are typically experienced technical people. You you need to sort of throw it out there um, and and give it some mainnet real world usage in order to a make it viable to attack because now there's actual money and b make it more accessible to people who are not going to set up a testnet node or anything like that yeah plus there's also a natural barrier too like your average average user with an spv wallet is not going to be testing this on lightning right that it, there's a huge barrier to even get set up and running before you can actually test it on mainnet yeah i must say though like I'm really impressed with what Jack is doing, Jack Mallers is doing with Zap. Um, and, and just sort of, I mean, he's obviously there's a lot of like dev, dev tools style stuff in Zap, but in terms of like getting on board and using it, Zap's kind of like reasonably easy. I can give it to a non-technical person and they can get up and running relatively quickly. Yeah. So, um, Samson, you told me uh, before the show that you wanted to quickly talk about the China ban, or South Korea ban, or whatever Asian country ban. <laughs> Asian ban, yes. Yeah, I think they're calling it Asian ban now, because it's easier, right? Uh, but yeah, the, the funny thing about it is that it's not really a ban. It's more of like a reban. So, there's a notice internal to the BBOC that was saying, you know, banks should not deal with accounts that uh, do cryptocurrency trading. But they actually announced that a long time ago, and it's kind of a reissuance of an internal memo that was leaked either on purpose or or not. But it's not really a new thing when you look at it. Okay, that's simple enough. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about South Korea? What's going on there? I think they're looking into more regulation, it seems. But <laughs> South Korea is... Pretty interesting right now. You have accusations of uh, insider trading from government officials that are banning Bitcoin. So I don't know. It just looks like a drama. Yeah, and, and the, the it, it was like uh, they they sold right before the the announcement or something. The announcement which wasn't really an, an announcement. Uh, some something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty wild, wild west. But I think if they do have a bit more regulation there will be a bit more consumer protection, right? So exchanges will have to be more careful about what they do. Um, they <laughs> have to ensure a certain level of support and service so that people don't get stuck uh, when they're trading at all-time highs and um, you know any other shady things that might be going on. Yeah, so, so there's this, we're in this weird place, I guess, where... No, you know, no one wants to invite tons of regulation into the space. But at the same time, um, if we want stuff like um, like patient capital, um, if we want uh, institutional investors to come in, then we need to have some regulation um, because things like ETFs, the SEC has made it very clear that they're not going to allow ETFs because of the fact that there's like so little regulation amongst exchanges. So you kind of want the exchanges to be um, reasonably regulated so that at least the SEC can turn around and say, okay, cool, we're now in a, a more regulated environment, so ETFs are fine. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I mean, that, that, at least from my perspective, is desirable to have um, institutional investment and, and institutional money coming in um, because they, they're less prone to panicking during you know, slight declines. <laughs> slight decline. Yeah. Those, no, those... no need to panic cells, just a slight decline. <laughs> People are screaming their heads off when it happened. <laughs> it, it always happens. We, we've been through it a couple of times, so... So many times, but like, most people, like 90% of the people are new. They bought Bitcoin yeah. or Litecoin at the high last year and they're scared. I, I'm so jaded that like, you know, it, to just you see the price go up, you see the price go down, and like nothing even, like I don't, I don't even look at it anymore. It's like it's like oh, it went down last week. Cool, you know, you you sort of rely on crypto Twitter to let you know. <laughs> I actually look like every couple of days, unless we're at a, at an all time high. <laughs> but in general, it doesn't really help you to look at it every day or every hour. It's just very distracting. 
yeah, well, I, I'm a trader. I look at it constantly. So for me, it's a bit different. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of like uh, it hurts. Sometimes it really hurts <laughs> deep inside. <laughs> So, uh, on to the first like re real topic of the day, uh, Coinbase. Uh, I think we're all surprised by the big uh, UTXO uh, problem or fuck up or however you want to call it. Uh, or at least it was like way bigger than anyone uh, expected. Um, so, the UTXO problem is an issue uh, that more exchanges have, but it was now uh, exposed uh, on Coinbase by not properly managing their outputs from trans transactions, they end up with, like, with a lot of tiny amounts and different addresses. Um, so in the end, in order to uh, spend or consolidate uh, these tiny amounts, uh, it would cost them a lot in mining fees, more than the actual amount uh, of coins that are in there. Um, but, I, but to stay a bit positive on Coinbase, they, they did say now that they will implement batching and uh, SegWit this year. Um, but uh, Charlie, can you explain to us a bit why the UTXO problem is still happening on uh, Coinbase? You're, you're, after all, you're working there for quite a while. I think it's just, um, I mean, I'm not sure how, how big of a problem it is right now. I mean, it's, it's like, in terms of like, the percentage of coins that they have stuck versus how many coins they're holding it's a really small small percentage but the nominal value is is fairly large today but it's not something that's going to cause them to go bankrupt or anything and i'm sure they can like partner with a mining pool and help them like clear out these uh, utxos by paying a little bit of money but i don't think it's going to cost them that much money um in terms of like why like why they haven't been batching transactions. I mean, the reason why it's it's like low priority because they care more about scaling, right? It's more important for, um, they make more money, they lose more money if the site goes down than the amount of money they're losing from paying a little bit more fees in terms of not batching. Yeah, but that's not the issue though. The issue is that they're clogging things up for everybody else, right? Uh, well, I mean, it's an open network, right? So if they're willing to pay the fees, it's like spam, right? If spammers are willing to pay the fees for a transaction, you can't call it spam, right? It's a valid transaction. So if Coinbase is willing to pay the fees, then then they're they're not really doing anything wrong uh, per se, but they could do they they could work on making making things better. Um, but we should we need to we should incentivize them to to do the right thing, right? The network yeah. should work. I tend to agree. I mean. At the end of the day, we, we, Bitcoin can't be such that um, it, it only works if everyone's a good actor, you know? So, I mean, yeah. you know, if, if Coinbase are willing to pay the fee and they don't want to batch, like, we can be upset with them because they're, um, it's not that they're abusing a limited resource, but that they're not using the limited resource wisely. But we can't really force them to do anything. Yeah, but the problem is that they're saying we need to scale the two megabyte blocks now, now. And while they're doing all that stuff, right? If they're just quietly working away and making their profit and paying the fees and just being a good actor, you know, in some aspects, then who cares? But the problem is that they got very political to do all these things while they're acting like a spammer, basically. I don't think Coinbase really went out of the way to, to say that they need to increase block size now i think mean, they just went along with everyone else it's not i don't think coinbase made more of a make more noise than any other company that i could tell yeah but they've been involved with with every single attempt at the four yeah five like with every every other implementation uh, xt classic uh, unlimited the 2x yeah yeah i mean can you blame them i mean they want to externalize the cost to to the network, right? Tragedy of the commons. Yeah, I mean, as a as a business, um, maximizing profit means if the mm -hmm. network is willing to increase the block size and they pay, they cost them less money than than them having to optimize their transactions, right? I mean, yeah, people are giving them crap about it, but it's not surprising that these companies want to uh, increase the block size that's simpler and cheaper for them. Yeah, 
makes sense, I guess. So, um, but we don't have to like we've it. We've seen some. No, we, no, of course we don't like it. No. Yeah, people are people show their dislike every time Brian posts something on on Twitter, right? So, I mean, I'm sure he gets a message. I mean, they're they're working on batching. They're working on segwit. Um, yeah, they they still want to scale, so they're working on all of that. And customer support, I and mean, people give him crap about that. So, I mean, it's it's tough. It's tough being Coinbase. <laughs> give him a break. Yeah. It's tough being boss. It's just a former employee. I know, I, but I tend to agree. I mean, like, I think that we, and I, I'm guilty of this too. We can be overly harsh sometimes on um, on on people because not just people, but on companies, and and sometimes we forget that a lot of these companies. Are uh, um, they're, they're fighting an uphill battle against um, against newcomers who have no clue how things work, and th- they're just trying to manage their existing and new customer base. And then we're like, "Oh, please make this major change to your system, otherwise we will write angry things on Twitter." Yeah, but then you, you, yes, that is true. But then you got to look at the other way too. So instead of doing that, they went and did Crypto Kitties Mobile. So priorities right yeah their priorities are, are really not in, in in the right place i understand from a business point of view it's, it's that of course you're just looking at the profit so what's the easiest quick win to to make more profit um so i, I guess in that way it, it their priorities makes some sense yeah. yeah i mean they um the i mean they report to their investors, right? They have to make the money. They don't. <laughs> they don't report to the Bitcoin users or the network. Also, I mean, like to be fair, they do have. They've got one developer who um, who's working on Lightning. So, I mean, like it's not like they aren't deploying resources resources around. They're, um, they're also trying to hire like five more developers working on open source. Yeah. So, I think they're trying to do the right thing, um, but yeah. It, it's difficult. I think it's. I think, I think at the end of the day, it's difficult. Um, and and yeah. you know, like I I have um, I have deep respect for the situation they're in, and I don't know if I would make better decisions. Um, I think all we can do is just keep encouraging them to to do stuff like batching and segwits and that, uh, because ultimately it is good for their profitability. It's good for their bottom line, um, and and it's a it's an exercise in futility if they don't do that. Yeah, I mean, SegWit is, I mean, I can understand why they haven't focused on implementing SegWit. I mean, SegWit doesn't doesn't affect their bottom line. I mean, that's pretty much it, all right? So they, it's more important to focus on scaling and to keep the site up to keep making money than to work on SegWit, which may be good for like a long-term plan, but in the short term, it's not going to affect much. Well, Bitcoin is all about the long term, so hopefully they... Hurry up! Yeah, hopefully they get the message now. I, I'm pretty sure they're working on it. <laughs> um, Coinbase's infrastructure is is quite complicated. I mean, we focus on security, so the coins are like all locked up in a place that's hard to hard. Uh, software's hard to change, and you don't want to just willingly change that part of the software without like real a lot of testing, because then you can like lose a lot of money so for example like for batching if you screw that up then all of a sudden like potentially withdrawal could you could send out five withdrawals of the same amount to the same person because you screwed up the the multi-threading of batching um and that that could cause cause coinbase to lose a lot more money than the fees are paying right if someone withdraws like fifty thousand dollars and then you send them like two hundred fifty thousand dollars and and they run away with it then you're screwed for a lot more than you're losing in fees by not doing patching. So I, mean, I can understand why they don't prioritize patching. Um, yeah. So um, we've seen uh, the last couple of weeks some quite big uh, pump and dumps. Uh, we've seen Tron. We've seen Ripple. Ripple went from like 146 million, a billion, sorry. Uh, then dumped to 35 billion, then went back up to 60 billion. Um, and it was on CNBC at like they literally showed you how to buy it on Poloniex, on CNBC, live, on the highest point. Like <laughs> when it was like around uh, $3. Yeah. Um, 
Now, we've all been at like a lot of criticism about the project, but I don't know if everyone knows the exact history. So it's a centralized pro uh, project. No one is actually using the token. The banks are using like the protocol. Um, but the first time I met Ricardo, actually, uh, at Consensus last year, he, he told me like a very interesting story about uh, Ripple that I didn't know yet. So, uh, Ricardo? Tell us the story. Is this about the missing blocks? Yes. Yeah, so, so there's, uh, there's like 30, 33,000, 32,000, something like that, blocks missing um, from the beginning of the ledger. And, and uh, I've had, I've had uh, arguments with, um, with Ripple people on Twitter who insist that somewhere, some, some node definitely has it, you know, so why it's not an issue. The fact that you can't find them is not an issue because some node has it and they can just ask those people for the blocks. What's the big deal? Um, and, uh, and also it's no problem because nothing, obviously nothing bad happened in those 32,000 blocks because, you know, Ripple's a good company and they would never do anything bad. They wouldn't have so, used those to create fake money or anything. I've never looked into their tech. How can you be missing blocks in a blockchain? <laughs> I, probably because it isn't a real blockchain. I don't know. <laughs> I've actually never heard of this. So they're missing 32,000 blocks that, that no one has. Yeah. It's so it's not a blockchain. You can just have like history removed and everything still works. Apparently, I, I don't, I don't even know. How, I don't know. It's the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life, and the the fact that it's like, like they they. I mean, how do you even sync up without those blocks? It, like, I, my brain can't wrap around the amount of. To be fair, of, all the Monero blocks are missing. I couldn't see anything, so. <laughs> <laughs> So look who's talking, right? <laughs> no, but look, I mean, you know, again, like with, with Ripple, as with other things, if they were just straight up honest about it and they were like, hey, what we are is completely centralized. We're like the PayPal of cryptocurrencies um, and we're, you know, we're not trying to be decentralized. Then I think people would be, would at least respect that, that more. Um, but they, they... But then they won't be yeah. billionaires, so... Yeah, but they... <laughs> It's okay. Just just get CNBC to shill it five dollars. Yeah, but they. I mean, they had, I don't know if you saw the argument that they had with Peter Todd um, about how like Ripple validators, even though even though like the default ones are are hinged off the Ripple domain, anyone can be a validator, and so therefore it's decentralized. And they're just like, that's it. That's that's the end of discussion. Anyone can be a validator. It's permissionless, and uh, and they they. Hammer, hammer on this point the whole time is if it's this magical decentralized thing and yet they constantly have relationships and partnerships with banking the banks that they're announcing which is wait wait there's no banks using it i read an article <laughs> yeah and, uh, the reporter is asking like who's actually using this and it came back like nobody and then i think a couple of days later moneygram said yeah we're testing something but moneygram yeah, so money, moneygram's doing a pilot there again the moneygram thing they're like oh we partnered with MoneyGram, and everyone is like, "Yes, they partnered with MoneyGram." <laughs> and MoneyGram are using the Ripple token, and then MoneyGram are like, "No, actually, we're conducting a pilot." Yeah. There's a disconnect between like the XRP and like their their Ripple protocol for banks, right? I don't think any of the banks are will ever touch XRP, mm -hmm. but they're. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose. They're probably doing it on purpose, but they're confusing the issue where. They, people investing in XRP think that it's related to their banking partnerships. They work very hard to imply very vaguely yeah. that this is used by banks when it's totally yeah. separate. It's like you could fork Bitcoin and use it to power a blockchain for yourself, but it has nothing to do with Bitcoin, right? Yeah, and the, and the price of XRP goes up, they have more money to do more partnerships. I, I know for a fact that they're using XRP to kind of um, like they're giving away XRP to these partners, right? As part of the deal. I mean, just look at the deal they made with, was it R3? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they do stuff like that. So it's, it's, in fairness, I they, just, they I don't do have, um, the money gram, the money gram thing is, I can't remember what the, it's called the pro product, the project product rather. It's called X rapid and it does use XRP for liquidity. 
So it's not that they, they are completely eschewing XRP, the token. It's just that no one is using it except for like a couple of pilots like MoneyGram. So, so they, they're trying to make it, it's like, it's like taking something that's a speculative token and trying to make it a utility token. You know, it's, it's not that easy and you, you can form all the partnerships you want, but like it doesn't just happen overnight that suddenly it becomes utility. Um, and I, I honestly, I, I don't see, um, I don't see banks doing this massive switch over to XRP, the token as a liquidity product. There was something else. There was a, uh, someone was doing a transaction and it never arrived um, at the other exchange where it was sending it to. So it was like they, they were investigating it and apparently one of the validators uh, went offline. So it, it was like literally called like Ripple Node 4 or something that went offline. Yeah, I saw so that. after like a, a, a couple of days or like a week, it suddenly came back online and then his transaction went through. So... <laughs> His transaction was just stuck because one of the Ripple nodes was down. One of the six Ripple nodes, right? Yeah, exactly. But don't forget, anyone can be a validator, so it's totally decentralized. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I never understood the <laughs> whole, the oh. whole like Ripple, um, how the whole consensus works. It seems like a lot of hand wavy. I mean, I haven't looked at it in like years, but when I first heard about it, I'm like, how, does this work? Like, this is just like someone says. Um, we'll figure it out. The consensus will form. But I just never, I never understood how it works. Charlie, the the distinction we need to make there is the original Ripple protocol was interesting. The thing we have today is is very different from the original proposal. Um, and and I think that like the original proposal was a lot of was was basically trying to do like a, a Byzantine fault tolerance style thing. Um, and the Ripple protocol today is just this weird mess of like validators will magically come to consensus. It doesn't matter anyways. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. So I want to do a, announce a contest. So I've got a, uh, 2018 SIPA calendar, a year of SIPA. <laughs> it's a, a calendar with 12 months of uh, Peter Willey, Sipa. So you can see we've got some really nice artwork. I've got a few other artists that contributed there that allowed me to use their work, right? We have- uh, Are you selling this uh, on your Blockstream uh, store? Yeah, yeah, we'll put a few limited you editions. You can buy it with Lightning? We'll put a few limited edition ones on the Blockstream store. But uh, yeah, I want to announce the contest. The contest will be, um, you have to come up the top five Peter Woolley facts. So you can go to peterwoolleyfacts.com to see um, what they are. But the top five uh, submissions is at Magical Crypto uh, will win one of these lovely calendars. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice to give back to the fans. I heard Peter Woolley was once in a fight with Elon Musk and won. On a rocket? Yep. Okay, we have a winner. We have one winner already. So there's four more chances to win one of these calendars. <laughs> Just uh, send us all, all, all uh, three of us already. Like, uh, I heard Peter really was on the witness stand and then they segregated him from the other witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> vape away. Let's just vape away. We need bigger witness stands. We're going to switch to some fan questions. Um, so the first one, how and when did you get into uh, Bitcoin or crypto? So uh, for me, I'll do it first. Uh, it was around uh, January uh, 2014 that I actually bought my first Bitcoin. I, I heard about it for, uh, first in around, uh, I think, 2011 on uh, Black Hat World, uh, which was a uh, online marketing forum. But it all sounded so much like a scam, like... Oh, we have magical internet money, and yeah, and there's only a limited amount. So um, I, I just assumed there was a scam, and I just ignored it for a couple of years, and then it got into the in the mainstream media, um, and then I actually looked into it, and oh, this actually looks interesting. So for me, it was around uh, 2014. So the biggest mistake of your life was ignoring Bitcoin when you first heard about it. Yeah. 2006, I got into Bitcoin. <laughs> 
only one year after I did. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, 2011, I read an article on Silk Road about, or sorry, read an article on Wired about Silk Road. <laughs> you mean you bought something on Silk Road? <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you are the way you are. Um, I use drugs to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 uh, just kidding. Um, yeah, I actually bought my first Bitcoin from Mike Hearn. Well, I was at Google at the time, and he was he was at Google, and he was he's like the Bitcoin guy at Google. So, bought I think I bought one Bitcoin from him. So I I also I also have to thank Mike Hearn for introducing me to Bitcoin because um, I read a Slashdot article in early 2011 um, when he released uh, what is it Bitcoin J and. I was like, oh, okay, what's this Bitcoin thing and why is a Google engineer so interested in it? And uh, I, I went and read up and read the white paper and all that. And I was like, oh, this is nonsense. This can never work. <laughs> this is impossible. And set about trying to prove that it was impossible and, and that didn't go so well. So, Samson, for you, when, when did you get into Bitcoin or crypto? I think it was 2013. I read an article from... Uh... Uh, not from uh, on TechCrunch, uh, talking about Bitcoin, and uh, I actually tried to mine that time. So I set up an account on Slush, and uh, didn't get anything. <laughs> so I gave up. I, I was really busy, so I was like doing game development that time. So I didn't have time to play with it too much. Uh, so I just kind of knew about it, and I was just watching it, reading in the news. And then uh, I got my first Bitcoin actually from your brother Charlie from Bobby. So. It was, at, it, was at, it was at his Christmas party, and he was uh, really trying to sell people Bitcoin. So I bought one from him. That was like 2014. That's probably the one I gave him. <laughs> <laughs> I think you owe me a Bitcoin. <laughs> and I paid for that. I did, I did give him a Bitcoin. Like Back then, like Bitcoins were $30, and I sent him a Bitcoin and play around with this. He never gave it back to me, so... Mm. You gotta, you gotta call him up. Uh, next question. Um, this is a lot more technical than the previous one. Um, so, how does Meltdown Inspector affect the crypto space? I guess that's more for Ricardo. Yeah, I, I think the primary issue is the any all of these attacks just can lead to things like um, key exfiltration. That's really your 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 main risk, um, and I think that. Uh, if you weren't using a hardware wallet um, up, up till now for storing anything over like a hundred dollars, then you need to really like reconsider your priorities. Um, there's, you know, we're, we're never going to mitigate risk entirely. You know, there's always going to be like like a really sophisticated targeted attack that will be able to to exfiltrate your keys regardless. Um, but a lot of those things, when we're getting to the point where they're compromising hardware wallets and that, that sort, that level of sophistication, that level of targeting, um, often requires physical access. It requires, you know, intercepting packages and all sorts of stuff. And, and I don't think you typically need to worry about that, um, unless you are literally storing millions and millions of dollars. Um, so for the most part, just literally just having a hardware wallet that you've ordered directly from Ledger or Digital Bitbox or any of those guys, um, Trezor or whatever, literally just having that is enough to, to shield you from a lot of these unknown attacks like um, Spectre and Meltdown and some of the new stuff that's coming out. Uh, that's that's a, a sort of offshoot from those attacks. I think there are also implications for exchanges too, because exchanges are using a lot of cloud infrastructure and they're pretty much at risk um, just because you know, it's hard for an exchange to scale up using bare metal. So everybody's almost on the cloud, which they shouldn't be, but it's not, uh, there's no easy solution around that. So yeah, it's going to be a challenge. It's like exchanges that use MongoDB, you know, I mean, like eventual consistency is not not the sort of thing you want in an exchange, and and uh, and so you some of the blame honestly lies with exchanges where if if they're doing that if they're doing like um, stuff that that 
isn't very robust and rigorous, like hosting on VMs and AWS. Um, they, you know, you, scaling is hard, um, and and if you're scaling financial software, it's doubly so because you can't do it the easy route. You need to actually have um, your own cage at a, at a or a set of cages at, at data centers, and you need to be able to like lock people out physically and all sorts of stuff. And there's no there's no way around it. Reminds me of there's one exchange that had their exchange running on a VM. And the VM restarted and came out like clean. Everything wiped in their hot wallet. All their all their bitcoins were gone because <laughs> they didn't have a backup. I hope it was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. They didn't realize that when the VM restarts, it comes back up clean. Um, yeah, it was like millions of dollars worth of coins. Probably it's worth a billion dollar now. <laughs> Learning lessons. <laughs> Growing pains. One interesting question uh, I thought is: uh, Is it possible that people are too complacent and lazy to find decentralization useful? Uh, if so, how do you envision the development for the development of the industry? Because if you think about it, uh, if you value decentralization, you will never buy something like Ripple. Yeah. Um, which is like the perfect example for that. I I consider it as one of the threats to to Bitcoin and Monero is. Um, is just the level of complacency that people have May, maybe more to Monero, you know, that people will go like, well, yeah, privacy is kind of cool, but is it that important? Um, you know, is it worth overcoming the barriers to entry to use this privacy enhancing project or tool? And, and if there's enough complacency, then, uh, people won't, they'll just be too lazy to do it. And maybe with the, Bitcoin and with other stuff, we'll see the same. People will be too lazy to figure out why something is a bad idea and they'll just use it because transactions are fast and they work and they don't really care how or why. But then why don't you just use PayPal? Yeah, why don't you? Because they want the allure of, of using decentralized internet money, but they want the ease of use of PayPal. So... Here's a good example, um, is you know, something like, like Dash, okay, with their master nodes and, and Dash evolution and whatever. They're doing this whole thing where, uh, as I understand it, you'll be able to, to register with your email address. And, and so the, from an ease of use perspective, um, users will find that extremely compelling because it'll be like a PayPal like experience. Um, and, and users can even be sold the story that it's decentralized. Because anyone can run a master node, just like anyone can be a Ripple validator, and and uh, and if you're sold that story and you get the ease of use, then of course you, as a user, you you might go, this is fantastic, and struggle to tell or to to understand why that model is bad, why that idea is broken. It's not something that that that's easy to translate into layman's terms. You know, like hey, user, this is bad, and here's why. Yeah, I think it's a really good question, though, and I, I think people are quite complacent. A lot of the new people, especially, they're just coming in because they want to make some money, right? And it's not even a factor for a lot of those people. But decentralization and censorship resistance, you know, these are all things that don't really matter until suddenly it matters. Uh, once you've experienced some kind of censorship or, you know, you need some system to be decentralized, it's kind of too late. So it's kind of like, thinking ahead of time or realizing something has value before you need it. And that's not a quality most people have. But actually, you could look at a, a practical example of this. So, you know, the Internet was built in a certain way. And now we have uh, risks of uh, attacks on net neutrality and, you know, nothing is encrypted over Internet. You know, we could have built the Internet so everything had encryption at the base level, but we don't actually have that. But looking back now, you know, that would have been handy to have when we were developing the protocol. I think most people, like far majority of people in, in this space right now are just here to try to make a quick buck, right? So they're just speculators. They don't really care that much about um, using cryptocurrency. They're more about like investing in it and trying to um, sell it later for a profit. So to them, like decentralization is just a, a, a buzzword. Mm -hmm. 
makes their coin worth more money. So they don't really care if the coin is truly decentralized or not. Um, I think, like Samson said, um, you, you won't really know until you're tested. And you won't really know, like, for example, is Dash decentralized, is Ripple decentralized? And then it's all about the fact that your payments is uncensorable, right? The security of decentralization is just to make sure that when you pay something, someone some money that no one can block you, no one can reverse your transaction, no one can steal your money. And um, Bitcoin is by far the most decentralized coin, but uh, for a lot of people, they don't care, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's a funny story. So when we launched a Blockstream satellite, uh, so we're, we're distributing the news in China on social media and everything. When we launched Blockstream satellite, a lot of people are like, oh, that's so stupid. And then a few months later, when China was saying they're going to ban mining and filter traffic for Bitcoin, then all of a sudden I noticed like one of our articles like was being retweeted over and over and over again. And people are saying, oh, this is really cool, the satellite technology, and it's really useful. <laughs> so you, you just don't know until someday you might need something, right? Or something might come in handy. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can miners actually run with your satellite technology? Can they like get the blocks that way and then get the transactions that way and then um, upload their blocks some other way? We're working on something. We're working on two-way uh, transmission up and down. So. Give us some time. Cool. Latency would probably mean that mo that that your orphan risk is too high um, if you're using awesome. that for mining. To broadcast a uh, a block, we should be able to do it. But you know, we'll have to work with uh, Chris, our head of satellite, and figure something out. I love head of satellite. Head of satellite. Yeah, I was just thinking head of satellite. That's, That's his title. <laughs> What do you do? Oh, no, I'm the head of satellite. <laughs> that sounds cool, actually. Yeah, CEO of Monero Enterprise Alliance. You know, all cool titles. Yeah, they they can only be one CEO. Oh, no, actually, there can be many CEOs of the Monero Enterprise Alliance. Anyone can be a CEO. <laughs> How much does it pay? So it pays um, it pays okay. about five thousand uh, Monero a month. But you just need to bear in mind that that's testnet Monero. <laughs> <laughs> okay, l last question. Um, so. Why do uh, we accept Bcash on our YouTube page, Samsung? It's because Will Panda wanted it. <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously. Yeah, that makes sense. We accept Bcash on our YouTube page? <laughs> what? <laughs> Where's my Bcash? The tip address. Well, uh, Have we received any Bitcoin cash tips? Nope, not some. I checked we didn't. We accept some Bitcoin, but... Uh... Why does the Bitcoin so Cash community not like us? I'm even calling it Bitcoin Cash. See, I'm nice. The Bitcoin <laughs> Cash community should be tipping us. If we don't get $10,000 in Bitcoin Cash within the next week, we're going to stop accepting Bitcoin Cash. And we're going to change it to <laughs> Bitcoin Cash Raffle. Okay, John McAfee. Or Bcash. <laughs> Bcash Raffle. <laughs> okay, uh... Actually, um, Samsung, you, you tweeted, uh, like, I think two weeks ago, um, that if you got 20,000 retweets, you would start making the short stories. Yeah. And I saw that now it's already at 16,000. I think someone bought some retweet, retweets, obviously. But we're <laughs> at 16,000 now. Okay. Um, so we're getting close. So uh, have you started writing a script yet? Not yet, but I've got some ideas. It's going to have a, a kangaroo. And he speaks with an Aussie accent. Uh, so does this mean I, I can stop doing this podcast? This stupid podcast? No, no, no. This is in addition to the podcast. <laughs> oh, okay. This is your life now. But you, you said you were not doing any uh, media coverage anymore. This is like your only voice. <laughs> yeah. The people want to hear you, Charlie. No, they don't. They just can't find Satoshi, that's why. <laughs> they have to settle for Satoshi Light. Yeah. Well, the Tron people don't want to hear you. That's for sure. Not Tron. sure why, hey? Tron, yeah. The movie? No, not the movie. <laughs> the shit going. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> the movie was good. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> A very productive day again. Uh so let's finish the show. Thank, thank you everyone for watching um, and see you next time. Okay. See you guys. <laughs> see Bye. You guys. Bye. <laughs>